You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Esteban. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 220. Today's podcast is brought to you by HitItBoard.com. HitItBoard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The Hit It Board can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The Move It can. Go to HitItBoard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's HitItBoard.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by OneTDC.com. Dog agility can be hard on your dog's body. Help keep their joints and muscles healthy with one TDC. One tetradecanol complex is a clinically studied blend of unique fatty acid oils that can support your dog's joint health. One TDC promotes a healthy inflammatory response from head to tail. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great one TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. Today, we're going to be talking about the AKC Agility Premier Cup presented by EEN that just occurred this past Thursday, kind of a random day for a championship event. But uh, our own Jennifer Crank was competing in the event and, spoiler, won the 16-inch class. Congratulations, Jennifer. Congrats. Thank you so much. It was a great event. And I uh, got to go to this event as spectator. Um, I wanted to be a part of this first year. We kind of don't know what's going to happen with this event, if it's going to blow up into something huge or if it's going to be a one and done. So um, let's talk a little bit about this new event. We did an interview with Carrie DeYoung a month or so back, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes, where we talked about this event just after it was announced. It was um, the, the short story is... It was put together fairly quickly, and the agility community was really surprised by it. It was an invitation event, and the people who were invited got, I think, five or six weeks notice, maybe, uh, to, to make their plans and decide if they wanted to go to this event. But let's talk a little bit about the format for those who um, did not watch it on the live stream or, or haven't looked into this event. Uh, it was two rounds and then a finals, and... All of the courses, both preliminary rounds, one was jumpers, one was standard, all three rounds were premier courses. So it wasn't just the name, <laughs> premier, uh, the Premier Cup. They were, they were premier courses. And there were only 12 dogs per height class. So um, every height class got the same number of dogs. These dogs were invited based on their performance in other events like AKC Nationals, Westminster, World Team, and invitational. And then after the first two rounds, the top six from each height class, so that's half for those of you uh, who don't want to do the math, would make the finals. So six dogs per height made the finals. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons why this was the format was this was an evening event uh, at a very large horse show. And it started at five o'clock. So the entire event Prelims and finals all happened in the space of something like four hours. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, I actually, so while you were gone having this great adventure with Jennifer, I was home with the puppy and uh, the children and the other dogs and just really suffering. And I couldn't watch any of the prelims. I did watch all of the finals. And of course, I saw all of Jennifer's runs uh, eventually. Um, and so let me ask both of you, I know, Sarah, that you've looked at the courses and probably more closely than I looked at the courses at the time, especially the preliminary courses, was the finals course easier, tougher, about the same as the two preliminary courses? Jennifer? I definitely felt that the finals course was harder. So one of the first things I noticed at looking at the course map is the finals course was, if I recall correctly, 22 obstacles. And I know our other ones were 18. Maybe one of them was 19. I know one of them was 18 obstacles. So, so already just on adding on obstacles, you're doing two things. You're adding the opportunity for more challenges because now you're adding on four obstacles, but you're adding on the yardage. So mm-hmm. I did feel like the yardage on that finals course was the most extreme, the most stretched out. And that was kind of where the added challenges came from, not in the, you know, the technical backside or the threadle, but what was really, I feel like catching people off guard was the extreme amount of running 
uh, and getting where you needed to be to run across the ring, cue that jump, run across the ring. And I know that last line on the finals course, kind of from one corner all the way down to the exit, really, you know, really presented some challenge. Um, some people were able to survive the challenge, but we also see, saw some people going into that last line and faulting in the last line. I know our um, in the 20 inch class and the eight inch class, the dog that was seated first was clean until the last four to five obstacles and both of them faulted right there at the end. So it was, in my opinion, definitely a little bit trickier, but a, a large part of that was due to the yardage. Yeah. And it was a very large arena. Like if you look at the course maps, um, they're 120 feet from one side to the other. So this is much more typical of what we see in Europe. We don't typically get this size of ring in the United States, which I think was great and exciting. Um, and like you said, presented challenges. And I will say as a spectator, you know, I saw some people that looked like maybe they were struggling on that last line to, you know, to keep up, to run. It's dirt, which is also harder to run in kind of. But I saw dogs that I felt like were, were uh, feeling those extra yards, were feeling that extra yardage um, as they finished out the course. So it wasn't just the handlers that were not quite used to that length of course. Well, I like what I'm hearing because um, of, of a couple of reasons. So one, um, a lot of times when you get to big finals at culminating at some event, it is easier than some of the preliminary rounds. It's almost like, hey, you survived the preliminary rounds. Usually the toughest course is some prelim round that you know eliminates a lot of dogs. And then you get to the finals and then it just turns into a speed run, like the fastest dog wins. I don't think that's right. I expect all of the courses at a big national event to be a little bit tougher on average than your local trials, your local situations. And then I expect the finals course to be Mm, the crowning achievement of that judge, something that's going to be uh, technical, but flowing, but something that's challenging. You know, I, I think um, that makes a lot of sense to me. You want to compete against the best. You want to be on the best courses. So I really like that. That seems to be a little bit of a departure from what you normally um, might see. And uh, the other thing that you're talking about, the yardage, I, I don't think that bothers me. But one other thing to consider is since you have everything compacted, in a, in a more narrow window of time than you're used to four hours instead of spread out, say over eight to 10 hours. Now a dog that runs three times, right. Within a four hour window, that's a little bit more intense on the dog. They're going to have less recovery. The handler is going to have less recovery. And so I think uh, fitness becomes uh, more of an issue. And again, you know, my opinion at high levels, uh, agility is very much a sport. And so I, you know, I have no problems uh, with that element as challenge. And and I do want to point out that the opening rounds were not easy either. Um, they they had a lot of interesting challenges. Um, we saw a choice. I, I mean, not a choice like um, I could wrap left or I could wrap right. I mean, a true bi-directional obstacle, uh, which is allowed in Premier, but it's not something that you would have ever seen in a national finals or an invitational finals or a Westminster final. And it just made everything a little bit more interesting. And I think that this is a great model for showing that uh, you can have difficult courses and have them still be spectator friendly. I, I didn't think it detracted from the spectatability of the event at all. Now, of course, I know a lot about agility, so I'm not your average spectator, but I feel like your average spectator likes it all. You know, easy, hard, just weaves, one A-frame, they think it's all amazing. And so I think um, you can have an event like this with uh, top-level courses, top-level handlers, and kind of give everybody what they're looking for. What did you think of the spectating situation? So uh, Jennifer, did it have the feel of a big event? What are your thoughts there? How many people were in the crowds? I looked, to me, they looked sparse on the video. But Sarah was telling me the arena was so big, she felt like maybe there were more people than it, there appeared to be to me looking at, you know, on my, on my iPad. Yeah, it was hard to have expectation to an event that it's the very first year. Mm 
right? It's the very mm -hmm. first year. Mm -hmm. I had never been to it. You know, none of us had been to it. Um, so I will say that upon initial impressions, I was underwhelmed with the crowd. I was expecting more. I thought, you know, there'd be a lot more of the horse people that would come on in and watch and you'd get some of the local agility. And I think that did make up a bulk of the audience. Um, but there was less spectators than I was expecting. Now, having said that, I do think part of it is the Coliseum was very big. There was a ton of seating. So you saw a lot of empty seats. Um, if we actually look at the numbers watching, maybe it wasn't so bad. But I think in my mind, I was the, the event that I was most comparing it to was Westminster. I felt like this kind of sort of ran similar, similar part of the country, similar format, you know, two rounds and then a finals. And at Westminster, I mean, you can barely get to the ring. You can barely get to the practice jump. You're ha elbow to elbow. Um, but Westminster has almost no seating. So, right. of course, it's going to be crowded because everybody's standing. It's standing room only. So I think, you know, I was expecting more, but I was in no way disappointed. So it just didn't meet my expectations. But once there, you know, you had the crowd, you could hear them cheering, you could hear the oohs and ahs as you were running. So there had to have been, mm. you know, enough people for that. So I think it was a great turnout for the first year. Um, it did seem that near the end of the night, the crowd was a little bit lighter than it seemed it was for the preliminary rounds. And I suspect some of that was just due to the late time. I know we ran much longer than they anticipated. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, with a five o'clock start, you have somebody who comes, they start watching by seven, seven thirty, you know, they're hungry. They're going to leave to go for dinner. And you have those long breaks where there were course changes that's what and I was walk throughs. Mm -hmm. And that's when you lose people. Yeah. Uh, and there wasn't right. a lot for them Good to point. do if they, if they weren't, it wasn't like they could go out in the hallways and there were activities for them or, you know, something mm -hmm. to hold their attention. Like at Westminster, when okay, one ring's yeah. done, you go watch the other ring. So if there was a long break for a course build, I think a lot of people said, you know, rather than waiting 40 minutes, uh, I'll just go ahead and, and head out. So I think it has the potential to do nothing but grow. So it was a, a great turnout, just maybe less than than what I envisioned with that Westminster comparison. Very and interesting. I think what I was disappointed with actually leading into it was um, the, I guess, the social media presence. Um, and, and I mean by the Longines Horse Show because I, I put them on follow first, their their page, their Facebook page, because I wanted to see if there was anything that they were putting out about the agility. And there was not a peep about this particular um, show that was being held in conjunction with it. They had they have great social media. They did tons of stuff about their horse stuff, but they didn't even have one single post about the agility. And I feel like when you're trying to fill an arena full of people that are not agility competitors, like AKC can't reach out and find those people. We can't reach out and find those people, but uh, the social media for the Longines show, they, they might have been able to reach out and find those people and bring them in for the event. So I think that if we want to see a big crowd there, we, uh, we need some social media presence from them. Um, mm. But it wasn't, it was presented by EEM. It wasn't presented by Longines. It was like in conjunction with Longines. So I don't even really fully understand that particular relationship. Jen, you went in earlier in the day when they were, they actually did have a portion of the horse competition on the same day that they had the agility portion in the evening. Uh, when you went in midday, were there people watching the horse stuff or not really? Because the other thing to remember is this was a Thursday. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 school night, man. Yeah, I went in uh, around two thirty. I think I went in, and it there was significantly less people watching the horse event than there were watching the agility. Okay, um, I know oh, wow. it was day one, but I went in there and I was so excited to see. And I walked in, and it was like it almost. I almost would have thought it was like training, you know, like they were just doing some training or something because there were some people down on the floor and there was a PA and it looked like, um, you know, there were some judges of some type, but there was almost no one in the stand. So relative to the agility, the agility did have a lot more, um, but it was day one of the event. You know, I assume similar to our events, it builds as it goes. So you probably had a lot more people on Saturday and Sunday. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty sparse in there, even for the horse jumping. That is super interesting because if we take a step back and we look at it from the point of view of the organization, someone put up $10,000 to disperse this prize money among the, the top finishers in the finals. Right. And so, you know, there's first, there's going to be that math question. Did we cover our $10,000? Yes or no. 
you know, if I had to guess, I would say no, but I, you know, I don't know. I, I wasn't there for the, the tickets and whatever other benefits that they might get, which aren't necessarily financial. Um, so, you know, the organizers is going to have to think about that. Like, do we want to do this again? Uh, if we want to do it again, are we going to do it without prize money? Are we going to do it with more prize money? And so, you know, there's that organizational viewpoint. I, I don't know what's going to happen there. It's hard for me to predict. One thing I do want to ask, because we know that they had to go kind of through the waiting list to, not the waiting list, the, they had to go further down the list to get competitors to fill all the spots in some of the classes, right? So that implies that there were people who said, thanks, but no thanks in the middle of the week. I can't take the time off from work, the late notice, it's not going to work, or I'm not going to go all the way to the East Coast, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say I'm a top level dog. I get an invite, but I live in California, Pacific Northwest. And I know that, you know, some people did make it out there and, and they're debating whether to take the time off from work and, um, all of that, I think a lot of them are going to look at this and, and wonder. And if they came to you, Jen, and they're like, hey, is this thing worth going to, right? Like, what are you, what are you going to tell them as far as like the, the environment plus the, the courses plus just the whole experience? Like, I know it's a very individual thing, but what is your quick like uh, pro-con, like your main bullet point? Someone comes up to you and says, give it to me straight, Jen. I, I know for me, because people have asked, you know, my thoughts and opinions, would I do it again? I would go back again. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm saying that as a person who lives in Ohio, mm -hmm. simply tra traveling, you know, over to New York, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I would have to think long and hard if it was a situation where now the event moved out to California. Because you are now talking about uh, much more time off, uh, more expense, you know, a whole extra day. And like you said, for agility, that is basically, you know, compressed into four hours. So you're doing, a, you know, two days um, for a four hour event. And um, for me, you know, kind of being self-employed, I can, you know, adjust my hours. But if I only have an X number of vacation days, I'm not sure I would spend two days on this event Having said that, it was year one. I think there was that that same attitude. I believe existed a lot when Westminster started. Sure. Eh, Westminster, sure. um, and then we saw it grow and we saw it and in, turn into a more desirable event. And now, you know, you have to get your entries in on the first day, or you're not even going to make it in. So, would I return? Absolutely. Would I return regardless of awards? Absolutely. The prize money was not a factor for me in my decision to go. But it was, I flew out that morning. I mean, I, I, I did not get on a plane until about 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, landed, had lunch, went to a park, competed, and was, you know, out of there by 8 a.m. the next morning. So for me, it was a pretty short trip with nice surface, nice courses, um, you know, and, and, and nice to be a, a part of another big event with AKC. So let's talk a little bit about the experience because this was the first year. There was a lot of expectation or um, I guess actually uh, uncertainty <laughs> and, and people were wondering how it was going to go. Um, I showed up with competitors. I traveled with a competitor, uh, Brittany Schesler, who made the finals and uh, we both came from Houston. So I showed up for the briefing. I, I listened to all of the briefing. I walked down to creating and all of that. Uh, so I could really kind of see what this was all about. And one of the things that was interesting was that AKC really had to uh, play by the rules of the venue. So there were some last minute emails, changing locations, uh, when, when competitors would be allowed to go in. The check-in actually happened outside. There was a table set up outside of the entire building. So like, you know, kind of like uh, in the entryway before you even get in uh, because they weren't allowed to go into the building yet. Uh, they had a briefing also outside the building. Just they picked a spot that had a little bit of shade and, and uh, projected their voices. There's only 60 people, so it wasn't that bad. And then they walked everybody down to the crating area, uh, very, very stern about where dogs were allowed to be relative to where horses were going to be. Um, and uh, and kind of gave a tour of the place. I, you know, you know, horses are going to be there, but it's still kind of cool when you show up and they're they're out just chilling on the grass. Uh, they had a, a tent where they were doing like warm up. People were just kind of riding their horses in circles. The horses were um, 
walking up and down the same ramp as the dogs, just on another side. And I, I saw a couple of dogs give those horses some sideways looks. I saw one horse stop dead in its tracks and refuse to move until all the dogs had passed. So it, it worked both ways, you know? Oh, wow. Um, and the other thing that I, I really enjoyed was seeing the uh, horse equipment that we have equivalents of, you know, basically like winged jumps and jump bars. These things were insane. I posted a picture on Facebook um, with me and Jen standing next to one for scale, but it's this jump is basically as tall as Jen and I are um, with, you know, these, she was leaning on the jump cup. It was like, you know, a six inch wide jump cup that uh, Jen was le- leaning on. And those poles are humongous and they just had them laid out. They took out, up all the space. Did you lift one of them up? I you should guys, have, did you? no. They, they were kind of all in a separate area, but you could see them. They were pretty and colored and they were like all lined up, leaned up against the wall, just all these jump bars. So I, I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting to see and to re- just realize how, uh, how much similarity I guess, there I, is. I guess that's cool. Know? But the thing that I was interested in was this VIP area that people kept talking about beforehand. <laughs> and I heard there was going to be like uh, entertainment and Justin Bieber and <laughs> all kinds of stuff going on there. Jen, what was all that about? Was it, did it live up to the hype? What was going on in there? Massages? <laughs> did, did not, did not quite live up to the hype. Uh, it was definitely uh, a nice treat and uh, a very nice perk. But so they had this VIP area uh-huh. for all of the competitors and a plus one. So if you had a groom, or you had a friend or a spouse that came with you, they also got access. But this VIP area was basically this big um, lounge and they served food and dinner and snacks and alcohol. Alcohol? Wow. Beer and wine um, in this VIP area. So when you were done running or prior to running, you could go up into the VIP area and um, eat. And it was great because, you know, check-in was between two and three. So we were getting there at two o'clock and the event ran until 1030 ish at night. So there was that question of, well, what are we going to do for dinner? But they served food up there and Mm. um, they had screens in the VIP area to tell you what dog was running. It did not. uh, It was not a video feed. But right. it was the same screen that went up on the Jumbotron. So it was a photo of the dog that was running that the uh-huh. handler had submitted and their name and where they were from. So you could kind of know where they were at. So if you went into the VIP area early, you knew what dog they were on. If you went in after your run, you knew what dog they were on. Uh, and so that was kind of nice just to have an area where you could go sit at a table, relax, eat, have a drink, um, but uh-huh. still kind of know what was going Wait, now, on. Did you so. share this area with, uh, I don't know, some spectators and other people, or was this just the competitors only? This was just the competitors and their plus one. Really? And, like, all, and, uh, uh, like all of the I was going to say, and I was just going to say, and the, the volunteers are like the, the VIPers that would have been through like EEM or the coordinators there. So it wasn't, oh, you see. couldn't just buy a ticket for the event as a local agility competitor and get in. If you were just okay. coming to watch okay. the event as a spectator, as a family, it was not an area that you had access to. Oh, okay. All right. So you had Very to have cool. your credentials at the door to, in order to be able to get in. Very cool. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the results in, in kind of wrapping up. And one thing, I wanted to go back to the, the format. Top six make the finals. And then uh, you mentioned prize money, but we hadn't talked about it specifically on this podcast. But first place got 1500 I believe. Is that right, Jennifer? Yep. And second place got 500 in each height class. So you're talking two of the six dogs are getting prize money. Yeah. Right. And um, top four get rosettes. Correct. Yep. And so four of the six. Oh, you those know. are pretty big. And they those were, yeah, they were huge. Huge. Saw, huge. Yeah. Saw pictures huge. On, uh, Facebook. R- right. Yeah. So, and then we're also on premier courses. These are not give me courses. So, really, in all heights, it is anybody's game. Anybody, like if you're at AKC Nationals and you have a slow but steady 20-inch dog and you eke into the 20-inch finals. You're not winning. And you run clean. You're not winning, right? There are not going to be 43 dogs that fault so that you can win, right? But if you make it into the finals at EEM and you run clean and your dog is not the fastest but is steady, it is absolutely conceivable that five other dogs will fault, especially on these courses. So relative to the national championship, 
the value of having a clean run actually increases. And you should you should note that you can get into finals on faults. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes. a, a decent number, a, yeah. de- a decent number. So we, you know, we say, yes, yeah, six out of the 12. So that's 50% make it to finals. I'm not sure if there, I don't have the results in front of me. I think there were dogs in most heights that got in with faults. I yeah. know in the 16 inch height, which was my height, dogs got into finals with faults. So not only is it anyone's game once you're in the finals, but it's really anybody's game to then make it into the finals because Absolutely. it was very tricky on, on premier courses. It was very tricky to have yeah. that double cue to have both the preliminary rounds run clean. And if we look at... I like at- that because th- then I think you're going to be more likely to make the trip. You know, let's say I live out in California. I get the invite and then you definitely need to have two clean runs to make the finals and, you know, everyone's going to have a clean run and you're, you're, you have a fast dog, but they're not the absolute fastest dog. You know, are you going to really, you know, get out there? Um, but, uh, you know, I really like that. So I I think, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. And and if we look at what actually happened, there was only one class where there were more than two clean rounds in the finals. So in all the other classes, the, you know, the two clean runs are the one and two that get the prize money. It was only Mm. the 12 inch class that had more than two clear rounds. Can we go through the results? Yeah. So, so let's start with the eight inch class and and I'll tell you a couple of things that I I recall from the event. Um, One thing about the eight inch class was you had Betsy Lynch with Wren and Lark, both incredible Papillons. And, um, and she's an incredible competitor who has won a lot of things, Westminster Nationals, things like this. And she ended up first and second, first and second in the, um, in the two preliminary rounds with her two Papillons. So mm-hmm. I really thought that we might see one handler uh, get first and second and sweep all the prize money. But she did not. Lark had a fault. Uh, so she did win the event with Wren. So first place with Wren, Betsy Lynch. And then second place was a dog named Logan. Yeah, that's the All-American. And yes. that's also a, a four-inch dog. Martin, so right. that was our P four-inch dog that yes. then got scored against the eight-inch class. So at P four, she was able to take that second place. She was also the winner of the P four at AKC Nationals last yes. month. All righty. Yeah. Uh, in the twelve-inch class, that was the class where we did have four clean rounds. Uh, the first place runner was uh, Amy Sheffield with Pixel, the um, American miniature American Shepherd Pixel. And second place was Cassie Schmidt with Bliss. So when I watched the final, that 12-inch class, in my opinion, was probably the, the uh, uh, I, I need another, a different word from the word best, but I felt like it was the uh, most a lot of class depth. to watch. Had yeah, there's a lot of depth, depth yeah. and it was very, very close. So when you look at the uh, time difference in every class, it was substantial between first and second, right? But first and second here in the 12-inch class was less than one second, right? 38.06 for Pixel, 38.84 uh, for Bliss. So, you know, Pixel, incredibly fast dog, right? International competition kind of dog. Bliss, international competition kind of dog, world team dog. Uh, and very, very close. And then you had Laura Dolan and Pri. Uh, you know, we're only giving the top two winners here, but I'm going to put Laura in there because uh, she went uh, clean and put up a 40 and she was runner up at Westminster winner the year before. And so there's just a lot of depth there in that class, a lot of experience there, fast dogs as well. And then when we go to the 16-ish class, uh, again, we had the situation with Jennifer. She was competing with Pink and Swift and went 1-2-1-2. One, two, one, two. Uh, Pink got first both rounds. Swift got second both rounds. Um, and so I was, I was hoping for a Jennifer sweep. Uh, <laughs> but that also did not happen. Pink did uh, win the event um, in first place. Swift had one refusal. That's right. And ended up in third. Um, so then the second place dog, the only other clean round was a dog named Skull. Again, this was your preferred dog. This was a, um, a dog that was jumping 12 against the 16-inch class. Um, Martine, I think it was a cattle dog. Yes. In the 20-inch height class, two clean rounds. The first place was Border Collie Graphite run by Pauline Simpson. And second place was Holster, previous Westminster champion, grand champion. Australian um, Shepherd. Australian not Shepherd. A border collie. Handled by Wendy Cirilli. And then we had the 24-inch class uh, the winner there was the preferred dog who was jumping 20 versus the 24 inch dogs, Harley, handled by Aaron Stumbler. And second place was with, without a clean run, uh, was Luna, handled by Shane Miller. And there was a bit of a, a thing that happened in the 24 inch class that 
it was um, very obvious what was going on to us there because we had a great uh, MC on the audio kind of talking everybody through it, but people who are watching on live stream weren't necessarily sure what happened. So we'll just explain it real quick right here. Uh, Harley, because uh, the preferred dogs are scored with their their normal height, their non-preferred height. So Harley runs 20 inch preferred scored against the 24 inch dogs. And because this is a finals, it's reverse seated. So that means that you have preferred dogs that are slotted in randomly in the middle of their height class. And you have to do a height class change in the middle of a height class. So that can get confusing. And in this case, the jumps were not lowered for Harley when it was her turn to run. So she goes out, runs, the first bar falls, and she is otherwise clean, comes off and and somebody probably, you know, probably she told them, hey, all of those jumps are wrong. And they had a little conference. Uh, the They went ahead and had the last dog of the class run, which was Daisy Peel and Frodo uh, at 24. And um, they faulted. So there had been no clean runs at this point in this height class. And what they did, which is very common when there is a equipment that is not set correctly and, and you have otherwise run a course clean, no off courses or anything like that, they just had her run that one jump. So she only had to run the first jump at 20 inches and, you know, quote, prove she could successfully complete, complete that jump at that height. And that would give her the win. And they announced all of this ahead of time. And the crowds actually loved it. They started cheering and getting all excited. And they loved the drama of, you know, you know that you are going to win if you take this one and only one jump and don't drop it. And uh, she got her dog all riled up and excited and took the jump and cleared it. And it took one more jump, I think, just to give it flow and make sure you don't uh, drop that first one because you come up short or something mm -hmm. and ran back and got her, uh, you know, got her uh, victory lap and, and the ribbon and the bar and all of that. Yeah. So it was, yeah, I didn't realize what had happened because I didn't know that there were no clean runs. I just assumed that somewhere in there, there was a clean run and uh, as a spectator watching on the stream. And then I kind of figured it out once she started uh, taking the lap. Right. So it's, it's a weird situation. And obviously, you don't want that to happen at your finals event. But once it had happened with all of the uh, jumps not being moved down to 20, it was in line with with how these things are typically handled in terms of uh, when there's problems with the equipment. local trials all the time. Exactly. And, uh, and then the other thing uh, to remember is that the only reason that gave her the win is because there were no other clean runs up to that point. So all the other dogs had faulted. Um, so she gets the win in first place. Uh, and the second place is the top faulted dog, which was Luna and Shane Miller. I think um, you definitely are seeing some of the effects of having a small field overall, uh, even before the competition starts, and then definitely a small finals field. You know, this is nothing new. We've talked about this even in the context of AKC Nationals. Uh, you actually see stuff like this in tryouts as well, right? Where typically, especially in the medium high class, you'll see anywhere, uh, I don't know, 16 to 24 competitors all vying for four spots, right? And so like t as much as 25% are going to uh, be selected to compete at the Agility World Championship. And so um, the value of the clean run for the medium height class at an event like tryouts is significantly higher than it is for the large dogs, uh, right? So if you can get through and put a bunch of clean runs on, you know, you dramatically increase your chances of qualifying for that event. And so th this is all just part of um, uh, the game, you know, for each specific event, given the uh, parameter of the rules. Uh, as a spectator, I thought it was really cool to go through the whole thing so quickly. Right? I, I really wanted because, to bring that up because I had the exact same feeling. If I put on my spectator okay. hat, it well, was really interesting. Yeah. So let me contrast that with a Jilly World Championship when you're watching the large dog class and there's 300 dogs and they're all running the same course and 95% of them are border collies. Listen, everybody out there knows I love agility. I love international handling. I get out there and I, it, my mind starts to numb. Not 
not only is that happening, but uh, the courses, in my opinion, in recent years have been a little, little easy on the easy side. Okay. Everybody's handling it the exact same way, same front cross, same blind, like very little variety there. And so uh, it gets boring. All right. But I was not bored uh, through this. So I thought that was a, a pretty cool um, outcome here. Yeah. And I think it, it was nice because uh, there's 60 dogs total, but every 12 you're changing heights and it changes the breeds and it changes the handling. And uh, it just did move the whole thing along. The whole thing was, you know, done quickly before anybody could lose focus, really. Well, I'm glad I got to go and report back and very excited, Jennifer, for you, for your win. So congratulations again. Thank you so much. I was very pleased with the pups and uh, really kind of, they actually surprised me and did better than I was prepared for, uh, for that event. So I'm very thrilled to walk away as the winner. Awesome. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, 1TDC, hititboard.com, and also NTI Global. Spring into summer sale. Start off your training season with some brand new heavy-duty agility items from NTI Global. Their sale starts this month. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high-quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. They also offer tamer and anchor weight bags along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com and use promo code AGILITY2019SPRINGINTO for 5% savings off today. That code will be on the show notes page. Promo code good through May 31st, 2019. Happy training.